Hi everybody. Um, I just wanted to talk today a little bit about my thoughts and ideas about breast implants and breast augmentation. Um, these are things that for years I've been telling every patient that has come to see me for a consultation thinking about having a breast augmentation. And so if you're watching this video, you're probably either here about to see me for that consultation or you're thinking about seeing me or somebody else for a consultation for breast augmentation. I hope that these thoughts will be useful to you. Um, this is um, the information that I usually give uh, patients when they come to chat with me, and I just wanted to go through this with you briefly so that you have some sense about what we're talking about uh, when we do get to speak. So the first thing that I usually um, like to talk to patients about are the what, where, how, and potential complications of breast augmentation. And I'm just gonna go through these uh, briefly. Typically, when we talk about what we would use for breast augmentation in terms of what kind of implant we would use, the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is whether we're going to use a silicone or a saline implant. There are obviously advantages and disadvantages to both. My general sense is that silicone gel implants tend to look and feel a little bit more natural than saline implants do. There are certainly benefits and drawbacks to both type of implants. Um, with saline implants, you have a hard silicone shell on the outside of the implant, and on the inside it's filled with salt water. And so if the implant ruptures, if the shell outside of the implant ruptures, the implant just simply deflates. It's like having a flat tire on one side, and it's usually very obvious to the patients and to, and to us what's going on, and the treatment is very simple. We take the implant out and we put a new one back in. Um, that sort of simpleness and ease is the kind of thing that sometimes makes people um, more interested in a saline implant rather than a silicone gel implant. But I think that what you'll find is that a lot of the things that people are usually scared about with a silicone gel implant are probably not quite as relevant as you may think that they are. Silicone gel implants also have a hard silicone shell and they have a gel inside. It used to be that that gel was very much like cooking oil. So if you rupture the outside of the silicone implant, you get this stuff like cooking oil that would drip out on the floor. And that would make it very easy for the gel to get into the surrounding breast tissue and to skin and be very messy. There was also a group of women that were concerned that having a silicone gel implant, particularly one that ruptured, would cause something called breast implant associated illness or BII. This is something that is being investigated right now by uh, the FDA and the implant companies with a lot of scrutiny. Um, it's the, one of the reasons that implants were originally taken off in the market uh, years ago, the silicone gel implants when they were taken off of the market because women felt that implant material that was leaking out of their implants could cause rheumatologic diseases um, such as lupus or arthritis and um, there was also some concern that it could even cause breast cancer. So when the implants came off the market, there was some, in, uh, there were a number of studies that were done, none of which really showed a great correlation between those two things. But now there are a group of women who are concerned about this again. And as I said, it's being investigated. My general feeling is that we may someday find a correlation between some of the um, silicone products and these implants and some of the immunologic uh, and rheumatologic kinds of uh, concerns that these patients have, but my suspicion is that it's going to turn out to be a very small proportion of women who have silicone gel implants. And the reason that I say that is that there are about 450,000 uh, implants placed in the United States every year, and really a very small handful of patients that seem to have concerns or issues with this. When I do find a patient with silicone gel implants who has chronic fatigue syndrome or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, I'm gonna take that concern very seriously for them, but I don't think that it's gonna be the majority of patients that get these implants in. In addition, for the majority of patients who have a silicone gel implant that ruptures, what happens to that gel nowadays is that most of it is more heavily cross-linked, which makes it stiffer. So instead of getting cooking oil that drips out on the floor, you tend to get it, um, a two halves of an implant that are more like either jello or even stiffer up to the consistency of like having a gummy bear, the so-called gummy bear implants that everybody's heard of. And so that gel sticks to itself and you end up with two halves and we think less gel gets out. But if the gel does get out, 
the majority of time it gets encapsulated in scar. It forms something called a silicone granuloma, which like a, is a hard, painless lump that you would feel in your breast. Most women know if they have a hard, painless lump in their breast, they're supposed to go see a physician. We image it and we pretty quickly find out that it is a silicone granuloma, not a breast cancer, and guess what? The majority of those patients have an operation where we go in and we take the implant out and any free silicone, we put a new implant back in, and they're basically in the same situation that they would be if they had a ruptured saline implant. It's the same operation. So my sense is that the risks of a silicone gel implant are not that much greater than a saline implant. And because they look and feel more natural, most of the time, I would suggest a saline, or excuse me, I would suggest a silicone gel implant for most of my patients. Now there are other considerations and that's not a hard and fast rule and I tend to leave it up to the patients what they want, but that's in general how I think about this. So I usually let patients decide whether they want a saline or a silicone implant, but let's talk about these other things that I have written down here for a second. Um, Textured surfaces were originally developed to help combat, combat something over here on our complication list called capsular contracture. Capsular contracture is when there is scar that always forms around every implant that we put in. But in, cert, in a certain percentage of patients, that scar tissue will, will contract. When it contracts, it can either dis distort the appearance of the breast or it can even hurt. Now, this is a textured implant. We will come back to this implant in a minute. And this is a smooth implant. These are both silicone gel implants. And this textured surface was found to decrease the risk of the capsule tightening and distorting the appearance of the breast or hurting in a certain percentage of women, but usually only if the implant was placed directly behind the breast tissue. If you put these same implants behind the pectoralis major muscle, the incidence of capsular contracture is the same. Okay, so it is effective in decreasing this, but when they started to develop implants that were anatomically shaped, like this one is, it's heavier at the bottom than it is at the top, they put a textured surface on it because they didn't want this implant to flip over. And one of the ways that the textured surface works is by allowing the ingrowth of that surrounding scar to hold the implant a little bit more tightly to the chest so that it can't rotate or flip. So all anatomically shaped implants have to have a textured surface for that reason. Whereas the round ones, if you look at them, they tend to assume a little bit of an anatomic shape when they're in a patient. We've seen this on radiologic studies before. And I like the smooth surface because it allows the implant to be a little bit more fluid and less fixed. So my tendency is to use a smooth round implant anyway. And then I usually let patients decide whether they want a saline or a silicone implant. implant. Now there certainly, as I said, are reasons to consider a textured anatomic implant. The reason that these were originally designed were, was to give a more natural appearing breast, a less augmented breast. And there are probably times when that's still a useful thing to use. But we have another issue that's come up now. It's called breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. I have another video on my Instagram page if uh, anybody wants information. There's information through our society at their website, which is plasticsurgery.org. But this is a Lymphoma, it is a um, solid tissue lymphoma that involves the, that scar tissue or the capsule we were talking about that occurs around the implants. It has now been uh, pretty well defined, we think, that it is the presence of the textured surface that increases the risk of anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Now, I don't wanna scare anybody away from considering a breast augmentation. What you should know is this is an incredibly rare disease that is incredibly treatable if it actually occurs. In fact, um, the risk of developing a, a lymphoma from a breast implant that is textured nowadays is on the order of one in 32,000 patients. So that's an incredibly low risk because those are only the patients that have textured implants. And when 
when you look at the real numbers of this, you're much more likely to um, die in a car accident going home than you are to die from a uh, lymphoma associated with any breast implant. So while this is still being defined and investigated by our society, my thought process is unless there's a really good reason to be using an anatomic textured implant, we're gonna be using a round smooth implant and I will let the patients decide whether they're saline or silicone. Okay, to move on, where would we put the implant? The choices are typically behind the breast or behind the muscle that's behind the breast. Most of the time we put this behind the muscle that's behind the breast. That's for two reasons. Most women that come to see me who want a breast implant have very little breast tissue and they tend to be more slight. And if that's the case, it camouflages the implant more so it's harder to see. The second issue is an oncologic reason. It also moves the implant further away from the breast tissue so that it is easier to see the breast on mammogram. The one drawback to putting the implant behind the muscle is that it tends to increase a potential issue called animation deformity. Animation deformity is where you use your pectoralis major muscles with an implant behind it and it distorts the implant. The implant tends to ride up and you can sometimes see a lot of tightness and tethering within the breast tissue itself. For those patients that have significant animation deformity, my tendency is to move the implant in front of the muscle and behind the breast. There are also some reasons that we would do that as a primary procedure, but those are beyond the scope of the discussion right now. The last issue is, as I mentioned, behind the muscle, the incidence of capsule contracture is a little bit lower, and that's another reason to consider placement behind the muscle. And then finally, how do we get it there? Where do we make our incision? Well, all things being equal, this is a decision I usually let my patients make on their own. Um, I will say that recently there has be, been some concern that this periareolar scar can increase the risk of capsule contracture by contaminating the implant with bacteria at the time of the insertion. Uh, my personal belief is that that is a fairly low risk and that this scar can, in some patients, be the very best scar for breast augmentation because it's the most easy to hide and it tends to heal the best because it's at the junction between light skin and dark skin and that camouflages it very well. So in the appropriate patient, I still like to use the periareolar scar or right at the edge of the areola the inframammary fold scar is at the bottom of the breast in the fold there. Uh, that's a very good scar as well. And the axillary scar can be good for some patients, but it requires a slightly di different operation that doesn't let me affect the relationship between the breast tissue and the implant quite as much. And so it has to be reserved for patients who are really very good candidates for it. Finally, I have a list of potential risks and complications here. These are all risks and complications that can occur with breast augmentation, but most of the time don't. Um, bleeding, infection, and scarring are risks that occur anytime we operate anywhere in the body, as well as delayed wound healing. These are things that just are inherent in doing surgery. The good news is most of these occur very infrequently with breast augmentation. I do just want to point out a couple of things that are relative to breast augmentation. Usually bleeding occurs within the first 12 hours after surgery or at around 10 days. Most of the time, um, there's nothing that happens that makes, uh, you know, that, that relates to this happening. It just has to do with the way clotting works and uh, when uh, people are most pr prone to bleed. So if this happens, it's usually dramatic. It's usually not like, wow, I wonder if there's a problem that I'm bleeding. It's usually more like, wow, this really hurts a lot. One breast will get huge compared to the side of the other. And Really, we just need to get you back to the operating quickly, take the blood out, wash it out. Sometimes we need to put in a drain, but most of the time it affects the outcome very, very little. It's very easy to deal with. Infection is very rare. I've only seen one case in over 20 years of doing these operations in uh, plastic surgery. If it occurs, the issue is that the implant usually needs to come out and stay out for about three months which means we've just augmented the other side and you're gonna to have to deal with some asymmetry for a short period of time. But again, very rare. And all of these scars heal very, very well for most patients. I've almost never had to go back and redo a scar after a breast augmentation. Delayed wound healing is usually very minor and involves just putting some ointment uh, on an incision line or something while it continues to heal up. Capture contracture I've talked to you about, 
rippling and wrinkling. These are a tendency in the surface of the implant to fold and for some of this wrinkling to show through the skin. There are different stiffnesses of gel that fill these implants, if they're gel implants. With saline implants, we usually try to overfill them just a little bit to avoid this. As you see, as we stretch it, it becomes smoother. But the main issue is, this is another advantage of silicone over saline in my mind. And also, um, we just need to look at the soft tissue characteristics to decide what kind of gel we would use if we're gonna use a gel implant. Malposition, I tell all my patients, I won't let them out of the operating room unless things look pretty symmetric and look good. I also tell all of my patients to remember that their breasts are sisters, not twins. And as long as I can keep them looking like sisters and they don't start to look like cousins, you'll probably be happy with me. But every once in a while we put in an implant, it looks very symmetric in the operating room and for whatever reason, things shift a little bit as the pockets heal and one will end up here and one will end up up here. And if that happens, we'll go back to the operating room and we'll fix that for you. Um, Rupture rates are low for implants, for all implants, for silicone and for saline implants. Rupture rates, I usually, um, I, I usually give statistics of about 0.4% per year rupture rate, but I tell women to think of, of about 10% at 10 years that rupture. The reason is that we know the curve for rupture looks something like this. If we were to graph this and this were time, um, and this went out to 10 years, uh, the graph for rupture looks pretty much like this. So this is the percentage that have ruptured. And so what we see is after 10 years, the, the rupture rate goes up pretty steeply. Um, that's probably just because of fatigue in the hard silicone shell in these implants. It's like if you take a paper clip and you bend it back and forth over and over and over again, eventually it breaks. Same thing happens with the silicone in the shell. And so some plastic surgeons tell their patients that 10 years, you're just gonna to have to get new implants. What I tell patients is, um, I have them come back and see me at three years and every two years after that. We talk, I examine their breasts and their implants. And if there's anything that seems out of place or doesn't seem quite right, we send you for an imaging study to see if we need to be concerned about rupture. I don't usually replace implants unless we know there's a problem. By the way, that um, schedule after three years and every two years after that, the FDA has suggested that schedule to look with MRIs at silicone gel breast implants to see if there's, if there's a rupture, because it might be difficult to know if you have a ruptured silicone gel implant. If the gel sticks to itself, it may feel and look exactly the same. Because the rupture rates are so low before 10 years, to me, that seems like a, a lot of money and wasted time getting MRIs for something that's unlikely to be broken. So we'll probably start imaging after 10 years, unless we get better information from the FDA, which they're looking at right now to try to give us some better guidelines. And then loss of the nipple, incredibly rare. I, the only reason I even mention it here is because I've seen it on consent forms in our office, which are um, a conglomerate of a national database. But the only way I think you could actually lose a nipple from a breast augmentation is if something really catastrophic happened, like a horrible infection or horrible bleeding, or if there had been a previous operation, some, some other operation on your breast that did something to take the blood supply away from your nipple. But for the most part, that's a, an a occurrence of less than 0.1% to lose a nipple from a breast augmentation. However, losing nipple sensation can happen. I usually tell women about one to 3% of the time there'll be a loss of nipple sensation. There can also be loss of sensation to the skin in the lower pole of the breast. And um, I tell women that if that's the worst possible thing that could happen to them, that they probably shouldn't have a breast augmentation because there are some anatomic variants in the nerve that could occur that could make that result on both sides. So something very important to think about. Mammograms, again, we talked about placing the uh, implant behind the muscle to make mammograms uh, easier to do. Nowadays, MRIs can be done if some of the breast tissue can't be seen. Uh, but I think it's just important to know that this does limit the mammogram a little bit if you have a breast implant. There are no changes in cancer survival rates or detection rates in women with implants or without them, however. So I think that this is probably a very small issue. 
And then finally, breastfeeding I know is important to some of the younger women thinking about doing this. The answer is that most women who have breast implants can still breastfeed. All right, so that's everything I wanted to tell you um, up front. I'm looking forward to meeting uh, all of you who uh, would like to come in and talk to me about the possibility of a breast implant and breast augmentation. Um, and I hope that you'll find uh, this mini lecture uh, useful and it'll give us a, an easier chance to talk about other more interesting things when you come in uh, to see me. So have a great day. Thanks.